Good morning, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our discussion about the Juneteenth uh, celebration in our state. Over the last uh, several weeks, we've seen protests and demonstrations across our state uh, demanding racial justice and equality. I've spent much of this time as your governor listening and trying to chart a productive path forward, look for ways okay. that we can come together and make meaningful change. And I believe that, that we can and we will. My goal is simply that, is to bring people together to help us understand one another, our shared history. And as we move forward, I believe that the, the least we can do is to commit to learning the lessons of our history, to actually learn, understand our history, to learn from that and to move forward. And that's uh, both the good and the bad. And that's why today I chose to close state offices in recognition of, of Juneteenth, which is a ceremonial holiday already in our state and commemorates the emancipation of the last enslaved African Americans in the United States there in Texas. And Dr. Patterson who's with us will talk about that. For me, this holiday offers an opportunity to, to have and encourage open dialogue, difficult conversations, and uh, to recommit to, to treat each other and one another with, with more respect. We're also working with the Delaware Heritage Commission and its vice chairwoman, uh, Dr. Reba Hollingsworth, uh, is with us. And so is its, its chair, Dick Carter, in the background there <laughs> to create an educational programming working with the Delaware Historical Society uh, as you currently are around the issues of race and, and slavery in Delaware and in our country. If we don't educate ourselves and acknowledge the ugly history around race, we can't begin to understand the anger and frustration that we've seen. So thank you all for joining us today with us I mentioned Dr. Donna Patterson is the chair of the Department of History, Political Science and Philosophy at Delaware State University. I understand a native of, of Texas. Dr. Reba Hollingsworth, I mentioned, who's the vice chair of the Delaware Heritage Commission, just a, a Delaware treasurer and a, and a jewel. Uh, Syl Wolford, who's a, an expert in so many ways and the founding member of the Delaware chapter of the African American Genealogical Society. And, who lectures on African American history uh, since 2010 and all kinds of different projects. I don't have a list of time enough to go through them all and I know he has to leave. And Dr. David Young is the executive director of the Delaware Historical Society to talk in, in what the society is doing and, and, and other parts of, of this. So, so since the, the uh, press release on this, this day and this conversation, I've got a lot of feedback about what Juneteenth actually is. Dr. Patterson, can you help us uh, start to understand what it is and what it's become to be in our state and our country? Yes, I can. Thank you, Governor Carney, and thank your staff for inviting us today. Um, I'm very happy to see your renewed commitment to Juneteenth in the state of Delaware. Um, so I'm a native Texan, um, and Juneteenth to me, uh, was a very integral part of my life growing up. And so it's very both surreal and gratifying to see this holiday uh, being accepted and, and really promoted in this way uh, throughout uh, Delaware, but also in, in, the, in the nation as a whole. Um, so many of you, uh, when you think of the end of slavery, you probably think of the Emancipation Proclamation, would hap which uh, happened in 1863, or you think it ended with the Civil War, which happened in April 1865. In Texas, we see the end of slavery ending, the abolishment of slavery ending with Juneteenth, which happened in June 19 on June 19, 1865, in Galveston, Texas. Now, Galveston is an island. Um, so that gives you some context of why it took so long. It took so long, one, because of where it was situated, but also because the slave owners on the, on the, in the city, uh, on the island of Galveston, didn't want to end slavery. But at the same time, because Galveston was situated as an island, it's more difficult in some ways to get the information to those who were enslaved on the island. And so Union troops arrived in Galveston on June 19, 1865. And hence later, this will become June 19th, a celebration in Texas. It was first celebrated in Texas in 1867, which is two years um, after 
both the Civil War ends, but also Juneteenth, but also um, the 13th Amendment which was ratified in um, 1865, in December 1865. Um, and the celebrations will continue. They continue to now in Texas. There was a bit of a lull uh, of the celebrations uh, in the mid 20th century, between, particularly uh, in the 1950s, 60s. And we saw a resurgence in, 19, resurgence in 1970. And uh, in 1980, Texas made Juneteenth an official state holiday. Uh, so it's a state holiday, there's no mail service, a lot of people pay for their time off, which leads to even bigger celebrations. So growing up in Texas, I remember Juneteenth as a very celebratory space. Um, it was a space of freedom, of liberation. Um, there were fireworks, there was, there, were food, there was food, there were parades, um, and just this really happy feeling where you would see people coming, people maybe you hadn't seen for the year, they would come, uh, family members, friends, um, uh, these sorts of people would come. Um, so a very celebratory um, space, if you will. And so uh, me as a Texan, even though I've lived out of the state for many years, I tried to celebrate and acknowledge Juneteenth. I've been able to participate in celebrations in different parts of the country. A lot of the country, including uh, Delaware has celebrations, New Orleans, uh, DC. Uh, I've even participated in a Juneteenth celebration in Cape Coast, Ghana, uh, one year when I was in Ghana when Juneteenth was held and they actually had a celebration. Um, so again, I think um, it's very gratifying to see the nation um, really think about Juneteenth in this renewed way and uh, as a space that really embodies hope for freedom and liberation uh, in the African-American experience. So has it, uh, you mentioned a little bit, it's different in, in, in many states. It seems that it's, it's got, uh, it has, uh, it represents something larger than just that specific uh, day in the history uh, of Texas and, and our country. Absolutely. Um, I think, too, when you really tie it to what's happening now uh, in the context of the protests, I think a lot of, um, because a lot of this resurgence that you're seeing, and, and so not just, you know, those who are protesting and people who are supporting and a lot of people on social media who may or may not be protesting, you know, really taking a hold of Juneteenth as a symbol, uh, but you're also seeing uh, states that are now, you know, making it um, you know, official ceremonial day that hadn't. Um, talk of making it official holidays in other states or maybe even a federal uh, holiday, but also a number of businesses and universities who are now, uh, you know, pairing their employees and giving them time off. Uh, Twitter is, uh, a lot of universities are, Dell State University started it this year, for instance. And I think uh, just kind of this current mood and this current mood of the country, um, it's, a, it's a great symbol of, again, of liberation and freedom, because I think as, as you're seeing the protests, Black folks are saying, you know, yes, we're free, but we don't have all of our freedoms. You know, what does this mean? Can we move freely? Um, you know, are we free, you know, not to be shot, you know, and, and, you know, in our houses, you know, when we're sleeping or these sorts of things. And so really just kind of taking a hold of what that means and, and bringing it into 2020 in a new way. So I see, see that Sill's repositioning himself. Sill, do you want to jump in there? And I know you had some thoughts you wanted to share. We appreciate again, Sill, that you're joining us today. Let me jump in and put if, it if in there's... full context. Uh, Abraham Lincoln wanted um, the Confe Confederate States to come back in the Union. So therefore, he wouldn't end slavery. But this was kind of the final threat to Jefferson Davis to say, hey, if you don't come back in the Union by December 31st, I am going to free all the slaves. And I'm also going to let African-American free blacks and slaves get into the war and fight for the Union Army. So he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which was an executive order, wasn't approved by Congress, wasn't ratified by the states. And basically, when the time came, uh, December 31st at midnight, it went into effect under the assumption, again, that it was the law of the land. And one of the major things that took place was 120,000 U.S. colored troops got into the war and represented 10% of the Union Army uh, at the end of the war. Uh, Lincoln decided that maybe this Emancipation Proclamation wasn't as legal as he thought it was, 
So they put in the 13th Amendment, they, they, Congress approved the 13th Amendment, and it went out for ratification. Uh, the, the, the border states, again, several of them, such as Delaware, still had slavery. So the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the slaves in Delaware, but the 13th Amendment did. So uh, the 13th Amendment was, was ratified in December 6, 1965. So here we get back to kind of the conflict that, again, we talked about getting these emails, we talked about conflict and when did slavery end? Well, it didn't end in Delaware until the 13th Amendment was ratified. So it was six months after Juneteenth. Um, and so this becomes part of the story in, in talking about the significance of, of, uh, of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, again, has taken on uh, its, its own definition or its own life, and it is being celebrated as the end of slavery. And I think everyone has bought into that, regardless of the 13th Amendment or whether it was an executive order or whatever, everyone has bought into this is the day that we're going to celebrate the end of slavery. And again, I, you know, I, I again buy into that because we as a nation should have a, a celebration of an end to this terrible period in history. So thanks, uh, uh, Sil. So Delaware uh, has a kind of a unique position all, in all of this as a border state. And uh, I just wonder if, if any of you want to comment on that. We were a state that was a slave state. Uh, as you said, this, this, the slaves that were here in Delaware uh, were not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation by the 13th Amendment. What's, what was Delaware's history with respect to the ratification of the 13th uh, Amendment? Obviously, it doesn't require, a constitutional amendment doesn't require all the states to approve it. Did, did Delaware uh, approve the, uh, the 13th Amendment? Do we, uh, my, my recollection is they were late to the, to the table Trump. there. Yes, Governor, you're right. Uh, Delaware did not ratify the 13th Amendment until 1901. And that's it, very it, late to the table there. That is correct. So it's not the first state in all things constitutional. And, and so do, do you have a sense as to how many, what the number was at the time? Uh, yes. Obviously in, there's... In 1860, there were uh, just shy of 1,900 enslaved Africans in the state of Delaware. Uh, the majority of those were in Sussex County, but they were in all counties of Delaware. That's in 1860. That's the last time there was a full census um, uh, before the Civil War. So it's about that number, less than 2,000, but a significant amount. Uh, there were also a, a, a very large proportion of free African Americans in Delaware, nearly uh, 20,000 uh, free Blacks in the state. So the implications of not ratifying until six months after, it, so, so those enslaved Africans became free, as Sil Wolford said, in December uh, of 1865, but the state didn't formally ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments until the 20th century, which in part had to do with not giving Black uh, citizens the right to vote. So effectively, what did that mean uh, on the ground in the state uh, during that, uh, that uh, interval? It meant, in, and I welcome my colleagues to uh, join in on this, but it, it meant a, a number of things, that uh, uh, the power of the slave owners uh, remained in many ways as far as educational policy, which kept a segregated school system in place for over a century. Uh, it meant uh, uh, Blacks could not serve on juries or enjoy the rights of citizenship, such as voting. So it has implications for voter suppression. It also meant that in the uh, aftermath of the Civil War, as a border state, Delaware was not required to report incidents of racial violence to the federal government, as other border states did. So uh, Delaware did not report its lynchings or incidents of racial terror against Black uh, uh, Delawareans. And as a result, Delaware is not represented in the uh, 
the National uh, Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, something Delaware Historical Society, University of Delaware, Delaware State, and the Delaware uh, Social Justice Remembrance Coalition are working to address. So it had uh, many implications for things that still are underlying issues that we need to address about the fact that the, the Delaware didn't ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments until the 20th century. So what, uh, uh, Dr. Patterson, you, you touched on this a, a little bit, but what should the relevance of Juneteenth be in the current context? And, um, you know, how should we respond to it uh, as a ceremonial holiday, as a national holiday, as a state holiday, as an opportunity to, to celebrate this history and also to, uh, to learn history that's not so celebratory? Um, as definitely both as someone um, who is a historian and someone um, who's, a, who's a Black American and a Texan, um, uh, again, I've been just really um, gratified to see this response to Juneteenth because I think many of us thought um, and uh, that this was our own, you know, kind of personal holiday in a way. And so even though you saw the ceremonial bits in other states, it didn't look the way that it looked in Texas and most of the, the country or the world, if you will. Um, and I think um, moving forward, I, I, I have to honestly say um, I am torn to some degree um, because I would love to see it, you know, a lot of states really um, make it a state holiday officially. Uh, and perhaps, um, you know, finally a, a, a national federal holiday. But then what does that look like? Will that change the essence of Juneteenth, the way that we see it now into these ideas of kind of African American freedoms, um, you know, once it becomes a major holiday um, and, you know, the consumerism that could potentially come with that, will it shift and morph into something else? Um, so I think that if that is the case, that people really try to hold it to the tenets of the way that we see it, the way it's been celebrated, um, and the way that people are rallying around it now in terms of, you know, using it to really kind of support and bolster some of the, the additional freedoms that they're searching for um, now at this time um, in this country. So in some ways, you, you want to hold on to it as a Texan? Uh, and what it means for Texas or? Um, not just for what it means for Texas. I think it means something um, very significant for African-Americans broadly. Um, so when I'm talking about kind of liberation and freedom, I mean that for, for black folks everywhere in this country right. uh, in particular, but I think we should keep that essence of it. You know, you know, if it's, if right. it's a major holiday, then you're going to get, you know, shirts and I don't know, figures and, you know, will it be watered and distilled down? I mean, because I think when you right. look at some other holidays um, that were created, it changes the essence and sometimes you, you, you lose some of the basis for those holidays. Right. Uh, Dr. Hollingsworth, uh, you're vi vice chair of the Heritage Commission. You're, you're a real diamond in our state and you've lived a lot of this history. You've lived for a long time. I hesitate. I always like to, to acknowledge your resilience by saying how old you are. And I, the last <laughs> couple may. of times I've gotten your age wrong. Uh, just share your story with us. You know, I, I've, I've heard you talk about it before, uh, but can you help us today by sharing a, a little bit with other Delawareans? Yes, I, I am a native Delawarean. Uh, I actually am on both sides of the fence. My mother's family were free blacks in the state of Delaware, and my father's family were slaves uh, in Delaware and Maryland. And so I've, I have the benefit of having learned a little bit about both sides. As a matter of fact, uh, my mother's family, the Scots, uh, lived out near Thompsonville, and their Thompsonville area has uh, crossroads out there, Scotts Corner, and all that area were the farms owned by my mother's family. Um, my father's family, uh, basically we're in Caroline County, Maryland, and uh, we were told as children that we were related to Harriet Ross Tubman, uh, Ross being my maiden name. Uh, and when I did the, my genealogy, I actually found the connection between the two families and had an opportunity to go back to Ghana and Africa, actually where Harriet's grandmother uh, had come from. And so I, you know, I feel that kind of connection. But growing up in Milford, um, during the uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so forth, it um, 
it was an eye opener, but I fortunately had parents who instilled in us some pride in ourselves and we uh, could not really, um, um, <laughs> we had to abide by the law, but we had to know who we were. So we had a pride in ourselves. And so uh, my dad always told us that we were somebody and that we did not have to cower to anybody. And uh, if we couldn't find a job, make a job. So all seven of us children actually were had our own businesses and had ways to make a living without having to depend on uh, getting a job from white people. Although uh, we all did get jobs because that was where we got the foundation. But uh, we actually found that our salaries were less than, uh, even though our work was more than the whites. Even when I started teaching in the state of Delaware, uh, they had a dual teaching salary beginning salary for black teachers uh, was $2,800. This was in 1954. And for th white, white teachers, it was 3,200, which means that even now at my retirement and social security are all affected by the fact that I had less salary, even though I ended up with a PhD and have had a lot of experiences and so forth. Uh, fortunately, I learned how to manage my pennies so that they could um, help us to survive. But there were quite a few incidents that happened in our lives. Uh, for instance, my dad uh, came home one time crying because he was working at the, the Dover Air Force Base laying the um, runways. And um, he had to train this young man to become the supervisor. And while he was training the young man, he was making more money than my dad was. And then this man eventually became the supervisor of my dad. And I remember him coming home really crying because my dad was showing him how to do the job and he was getting paid, the white fellow was getting paid for it. And it was that kind of thing that made my dad tell us uh, that we were somebody and to make our own way. So you know, that's what we did. But that didn't uh, really alter the fact too much that um, uh, we felt like we were important. And when we did our, when I did the genealogy and search, I realized that um, we are really somebody and, and it, that depends on how other people look at us. But that doesn't mean that I feel the same way about it. As far as our education was concerned, um, it was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Young about the uh, segregated schools. Uh, when I went to school in Delaware, of course, they were segregated. Uh, even though I could walk to Milford High School, I couldn't attend there. So I, as a 10th grade student, had to rent a room here in Dover with two other students and go to Booker T for the 10th grade, completely on our own, and no supervision or anything, and went home on weekends. And then as a 11th grade, 12th grade, I went out to Delaware State College High School in the dormitory situation there where we couldn't even uh, leave the campus except once a month and all those things. But that was the only time when I went to Delaware State College and bought my own books that I actually had a new book because all the books that we got from in Milford uh, school number three, <laughs> 3C, which was colored school, came from the Milford white school district. And I remember the um, principal of our school, Mr. Waters, actually had ordered some books for our school and when they didn't come in, he called the superintendent to find out what uh, had happened to the books and found out that instead of getting the new books at our school, they were at the white school. And we got a box of old books, used books, which is what we got every year. And we had to clean those out and erase them in order to be able to use them. But that really, um, you know, we thought, and because everybody said our education was inferior, uh, and, and we thought that because, you know, we were limited in so many ways. But when I got an opportunity to go to the University of Delaware in 1952 to work on my master's, I found out <laughs> that I was making A's and B's where some of those other people were only making B's and C's. And so I realized uh, that my education might have been inferior by some standards and certainly was segregated, but my education was really uh, very broad because even as far as the black history programs were concerned, all of our subject matter, um, all of our teachers actually made sure that our subject matter included the contributions of blacks to our math classes, our English classes and so forth. And so um, we knew about black history and we knew about slavery. We even knew about African, the African continent and the countries there where we found that a lot of people really didn't even know what was going on uh, in Newcastle County if they lived in Sussex County or didn't know what was going on in Sussex County if they lived in Newcastle County because the 98 miles was too far for some people to travel. But um, I, I feel blessed because uh, I've grown to realize that when people are really trying to do you harm, they're actually doing you a favor because if I had not had some of the experiences as 
a black woman, a black student, black child in Delaware, I certainly would not have had some of the experiences that I have had as a black woman in Delaware, having traveled throughout all 50 states, uh, several countries, uh, without my husband or I being in the military. And we've had a lot of experiences um, meeting and greeting other people and doing things that a lot of my white friends haven't even done. So uh, from that standpoint, you know, you grow and I don't let things, the past, because I can't change it, uh, bother me. But I do think that the past should serve to help us make a better future. Thank you, Do Dr. Hansworth. You mentioned that you're at the University of Delaware working on your master's there in 1952, I think you said. And so yes. a couple of years later, uh, the board there at Milford School District tried to integrate the schools unsuccessfully, I guess, initially. Do, do you, were you still in Delaware at, at the time? And do you have personal recollections of that? Yeah. Uh, actually, the students from Delaware State College uh, actually tried to integrate the University of Delaware in 1950. And um, they were actually the first university nationwide that uh, actually was able to integrate the students. When I went out there in 1952, the school was open to Blacks, but the uh, attitude and the climate there was not very receptive. And so, you, I, you know, you had to really have a very strong personal <laughs> feeling per uh, in order to sustain some of the stuff that went on. Uh, some of my friends who attended there actually left because they couldn't take some of the um, hatred and racism that existed there, but I had a strong constitution and I knew who I was. So I just stayed and, you know, let them. As a matter of fact, I had one experience that I've told Dick about where um, one of the students in the class of 1952, uh, it later became employed at the University of Delaware and became my advisor while I was still working on my master's. Um, and when she found my record, she found that the class that we had had in 1952 were a class that I had made an A in and she had made a B in. So she told me that no matter what I did, I would never be able to make anything more than a B in her class. But you, know, you, <laughs> you learn to deal with what you have to deal with. Um, actually, when I got the job uh, as a <laughs> guidance counselor at Delaware, uh, Dover High School. Um, I was still having to work on my master's in counseling as well as in home economics. And uh, I was going to lose all the credits that I had earned toward my master's in home economics. I really didn't think that was fair. So I talked with the uh, certification department, Dr. Elizabeth Lloyd, and explained my case. And she took it before the committee and they changed the law so that I didn't lose but six credits. So when I got my master's, I actually got master's plus 30 at the same time. So when, you know, people think they're doing something against you, they are actually helping you in a way. So I just look at my life in that way. And I've tried to you know, make my parents proud of what I've done. Well, you certainly have uh, uh, demonstrated personally the resilience uh, of a whole people in our state and in our country. And as I, I like to say, you really are a, a prize for all of us, and we appreciate uh, you being with us today and sharing uh, some of that history that uh, that you live firsthand. Uh, Dr. Uh, Young, would you like to put in a greater context some of what the, the Historical Society is doing and kind of where you think we should go as we engage uh, Delawareans in this conversation and, and uh, a greater appreciation of our, our history, our broader history? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Governor. And, uh, you know, history is the great free lunch. Uh, you, you hear that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. That's right. And the more we learn about it, the more it informs understanding of what we need to do now. Dr. Hollingsworth talked about her father uh, helping lay the runways at Delaware Air Force Base, or Dover Air Force Base, excuse me. Well, that was on uh, land that was the Byfield Plantation owned mm -hmm. by Caesar and Thomas Rodney. Mm -hmm. uh, much of Delaware's history is connected with the slave owning economy of Maryland, Virginia, uh, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Uh, so this embeds uh, much of enslavement in how we understand uh, the history of Delaware and its contradictions of being the first state to ratify the Constitution, but not one of the, but one of the last states to ratify uh, the amendments that ended enslavement or gave blacks the right to vote. 
Today, by the way, is the anniversary, uh, 56 years ago today, 1964, the Civil Rights uh, Act was passed and signed into law. So uh, there's an importance in understanding these commemorative opportunities with Juneteenth. Uh, and imagine if we have a, a, a way to celebrate Juneteenth and we continue it for a fortnight into celebrating Independence Day, that's quite an opportunity to inform uh, people about the, the need for understanding history because the underlying issues have not changed and still need to be addressed. Many of the things that Dr. Hollingsworth has just discussed are still with us. The uh, inequity in education, uh, the access to the vote and, and voting rights, uh, the ability for people to have uh, equal justice uh, and equal representation before the law, uh, among many other things, wage uh, and, and job opportunities have been affected uh, in part because of uh, wage disparities in history, and that has uh, consequences for how value is passed on from one generation to another. And African Americans haven't had the advantages that many others in the American body politic have. So uh, it's important for us going forward to consider how Juneteenth can uh, stimulate uh, an understanding of, through education and learning the accurate history, uh, but also to equip us with a vocabulary going forward to, uh, to address many of these underlying issues that haven't gone away. And the events and the protests of the last couple of weeks after the death of George Floyd and many other instances of racial violence uh, uh, bring to the fore our need as a nation to address these underlying uh, issues. Uh, I'm happy to say that our historical society has the Mitchell Center uh, for African American Heritage, which is a center dedicated to understanding the history of all Delawareans. And the Mitchell Center under the director of, uh, direction of Dr. Stephanie Lampkin has many of the uh, exhibitions uh, and programs and connections with schools and universities that help tell all the stories of the Delaware Black experience, including the things that do not necessarily reflect well on Delaware, such as school segregation, such as the 1968 uh, National Guard occupation of Wilmington, which has been recalled in the last couple of weeks of the racial pro uh, of the protests uh, against the death of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police. So these things are with us. The history hasn't gone away. And the more we embrace it through conversation, through dialogue, and the consideration of other perspectives on the past, history depends on where you're standing. And understanding uh, people and their own uh, sense of history, but also offering opportunities to discuss the perspectives that may not have occurred to us because we don't know everything we can know about the past, becomes an opportunity that things like the, the, the embrace of Juneteenth and the fortnight of freedom and independence uh, that, uh, the, that June 19th to July 4th that may bring us an opportunity to delve deeper into this discussion and get people out of their comfort zones mm -hmm. and that simplistic understanding they may have of the past. Uh, because that uh, can be uh, um, an opportunity. I might not have thought about it like that, or I bet I didn't, oh, I, did, I hadn't thought about it like that. What, what, what do I need to know more of? which can uh, bring people to, to an understanding, you know, the statues may go away, but statues aren't history. They're expressions of the values of a community at a select point in time. And our values change the more we understand history. And therefore we can see uh, a, a, an evolving sense of history and rewrite it, hopefully together. So um, you've touched on this and uh, Dr. Patterson, you know, expects concern about uh, becoming more commercialized and lose, losing meaning. I mean, how do we, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we focus uh, as we uh, look forward to celebrating and recognizing Juneteenth in the future? Um, there could be some challenges, but I think kind of going on what David's just said, you know, educating people. 
because mm -hmm. educating people to the tenets of Juneteenth, um, to some of the injustices in this country, and really trying to get them to adhere to that. So, you know, in future celebrations, really incorporate this into some of the ceremony and some of the celebrations. Um, but also, I'm expecting that we're going to see more on Juneteenth in terms of you know, maybe documentaries or books and this sort of thing. Um, we're definitely seeing a lot of op-eds. I mean, if you look today, there are op-eds. I think there are two in the New Yorker. The last few days, you've seen the Washington Post do an op-ed and a video. And so really educating people. So incorporating that into the ceremonies and the celebrations will help uh, really adhere to the essence and the meaning of the holiday and the tradition. So as I made the uh, phone calls, and David, I, I go back to you in a second and then let Dr. Hollingsworth have the last word. As I talked to some legislators about, about uh, today, uh, each of them uh, mentioned that uh, their frustration that a lot of young folks don't know what a Juneteenth is, is all about. Dr. Patterson, you, you teach those young folks uh, on a regular basis. What, what's the relevance or what do you hear from them with respect to Juneteenth or, or uh, this history of our state and our country? Okay, well, we're not in session, so I'm not hearing a lot right now. But what I can say <laughs> is that when I teach sections of African American history, I always incorporate Juneteenth. So we talk about this in the broader conversation of what emancipation looked like, you know, the years of emancipation. But I think even moving beyond that, um, you know, there was talk about Delaware and, you know, kind of ratifying a lot of these things well into the 20th century. Um, you had people who were still working in some cases in semi-free states. There were people on plantations throughout the South uh, in particular, you know, working. So they were free, but they were working for, in many cases, uh, repress, repress wages. Uh, there were people still, you know, living and born on plantations uh, in parts of Louisiana and, and other parts of the country well into the 20th century until the 1930s uh, and 40s. And so, um, you know, the history, um, you know, is really not that far away. Um, and so I definitely teach it, I teach it to them and I think um, in classes, but I think now uh, many of them will, you know, see it in a different way, seeing all this social media and other media interest and state interest uh, in the holiday and celebration. There are also new ways to tell history uh, in addition to uh, learning more as, as history is uncovered and more research comes to the light. But it's actually an exciting time to learn about history. We're involving young people, uh, the creative arts, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 on our website, the dehistory.org, you can see enrichment packets about uh, the colonial experience, about uh, African-American heroes in Delaware. And uh, the, the, these are ways to engage young people in history they may not have known, and, and really all citizens. And when you consider even a, a phenomena like the Hamilton musical, there are new ways to bring forward even history we know very well, such as of the founders, and to look at uh, the, the complexity of the individuals who made such history. So with National History Day, with the Mitchell Center uh, for African American Heritage Programming, my organization is poised to work with the Heritage Commission. And I hope, Governor, that the legislators you'll talk to about this really important initiative will see uh, some uh, wisdom in, in the resources necessary to carry the work forward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Young, and thank you for uh, your efforts with the Mitchell Center and, and all the things you're doing. Dr. Holling, Hollingsworth, uh, some, some last thoughts from the person who's lived uh, more of this history than, than most. Only six, almost uh, 94 years, that's all. <laughs> I, I want us to though, realize that we are each making history and we want to be sure that the history we are making to leave to our, uh, our young children, grandchildren and so forth is a viable history that does not uh, have the same kind of um, hatred and the uh, lack of knowledge of each other and the fear that so many people seem to have of each other without realizing uh, and I said the fear actually is nothing except false evidence appearing real. So if we can make sure that we uh, educate uh, our young people and make sure that what we do is going to be worthy of note uh, 10, 15, 100 years from now. I hope I was around, but I know I won't be, but I'll leave some good history. <laughs> You're going to be around for a long time, Dr. Hollingsworth. Uh, again, to, to each of you, thanks for joining us today. 
on Juneteenth uh, 2020. It's been an extraordinary year. I thank you for what each of you do uh, to make sure more Delawareans and folks that come to Delaware State University uh, know about uh, our history, the history of African Americans, the history of Delawareans. We appreciate the, your, the institutions that you lead. And Dr. Hollingsworth, it's always wonderful to see you. God bless Thank you. you. Have, a, have a good Juneteenth. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. You, you too. <laughs>